Hello, this is Julia Davis of Yoga Teachers Forum, and I'm here today with Donna Noble to talk about yoga, culture, diversity, curve some yoga. Hi, how are you today? Hi, Donna? Julia. I'm good, thank you. How are you doing? I'm very well, I'm very well. Um, I'd love to hear about how you came to practice yoga to start off with. Um, it was a colleague um, stroke friend when I was working um, in my corporate um, life and she saw a picture of Madonna one day in one of the, the newspapers um, with a, in a posture with her leg behind her head and essentially was impressed with that and said let's do yoga. So she ordered some yoga mats and that was that with a colleague fortunately that was trained to be a yoga teacher so we became her guinea pig and were able to go down to the boardroom and um, practice yoga. Sounds good. And then how did it continue from there? So. Um, it continued from there. That, um, after that, I wanted to find a course that um, wasn't full of advanced students. So I then found a beginner's course and did that. And just um, did various styles of yoga around London. Um, but I, it, it's, my journey stopped for about three or four years while I completed my master's degree. Because it's like I, couldn't, I wouldn't have enough time to do yoga, my master's and work at the same time. And so was, um, my journey started again uh, when I was working for um, a company that had an in-house gym and they started to bring yoga classes into that environment. And I was able to go down and do yoga in-house. And that's why it, my, my love for yoga um, resumed again. But it was my, it was Vikram Yoga that was, was key in getting me to where I am today because um, a friend of mine, I know loads of people that kept saying, Donna, have you heard about this hot yoga? You stand in the hot room. And I was like, no, I don't need that. I, you know, I've been taught to warm my body up from the inside out. But when the studio opened up in South London, I had to go and try it out when a friend of mine informed me that, you know, 30 pounds is 30 days. So one pound a day, I thought I, I've got nothing to lose. And everything they tell you not to do in Bikram, I did. I had a hangover, unfortunately. I was the hottest part of the room. I had the strictest teacher ever. And, um, yeah, and, and that was it. But I came out of that room. The hangover had gone. I detoxified in that room and I came out feeling amazing and went a few more times, loved it and actually signed up and um, signed up for their annual membership. Mm. And then basically it was when I became ill with Bell's palsy that um, yoga really helped me because it helped me to heal um, in terms of, of, of recovery, but also leading a more holistic lifestyle. And it made me reevaluate my life in terms of seeing that what I was doing wasn't making me happy. And I still didn't know that I wanted to do yoga or become a yoga teacher. It was never my intention to until a friend of mine said, you need a plan B. And I thought, plan B? What do you mean about I need a plan B? You know, I've got the job, I've got the cows, I've got the car, all the things that society tells you that you should have and you need. And it's when I, um, I, I went to do a master NLP master practitioner course that um, I was asked about what I was going, going through and I was told that basically that I did know unconsciously what I want to do after studying at Tri Yoga. I was on the course at that point because it was going to be something I did maybe when I retired, become a teacher, you know, the certification, it was nothing I was going to do straight away. And they, everyone was like, you're really calm about this, Donna, what's going on? I said, what do you mean? I'm just, I'm just you know, getting on with life type thing. And then I was informed at this course that unconsciously I knew what I wanted to do, that when I spoke about yoga, I lit up. And when I spoke about corporate, I didn't. And then at that, in that moment, I decided to finish my trial of teacher training because I was going to finish at the end of the year. And then what I would do, because I didn't want to teach and set up on my own in terms of um, yoga classes, I would do Bikram because there were so many students around London. So I decided to go to LA for nine weeks and do the teacher training course and then come back to London and, and just and start teaching. But all my friends said that I started to change because when I went on that plane, um, I stayed for six months instead. And I just traveled around um, America just teaching and being in a wonderful yoga bubble and came back, did Bikram. And um, then I began to question after about a year or two whether or not I could, su could sustain this because basically I had the corporate lifestyle but not getting the corporate money. So I did for a short time deliberate going back into corporate and I didn't want to. But what then happened is um, I saw an article about a curvy yogi who didn't have a nice experience of yoga. And being the largest person in the room, she was either stared at by other, yog um, other yogis and ignored by the teachers. And then something really resonated with that. So I kept talking about that article until my friends were like, well, shut up. 
or do something about it. And then it was like, well, what can I do? So I had a coach at the time and she said, well, set something up. And I, and I said, okay, I'm going to um, create something, but I need everyone to know it's sort of different. So I like the word wholesome. So that everyone knew it was like, you know, you, you didn't have to be slim to do yoga. But wholesome for me sounded like bread. And I thought wholesome yoga didn't have a nice ring to it. And I liked curvy, so I searched every single permutation of the word curvy, but it seemed to have gone like curvy girl yoga, curvy yoga, all those are already gone. And then I had the, the, the I had this um, brilliant idea of putting curve with some. So I got a little bit of what I wanted out of the, the name that I had thought of. So that's when Curve Some Yoga was um, created. Still didn't know what I was doing. So I did, you know, didn't know if there was a market or a need for what I was doing. Um, but discovered sort of Diane Bondi and saw there was sort of a body positive movement in America and saw these individuals doing amazing things with their bodies. And so I began to sort of um, do that basically. And later that year, I decided to go to the Om Show. So you need to go to Om Show, but in the beginning, no one knew who was behind Curse and I was hiding. No one knew because some of the times I got challenged, like, you know, to say, you're not curvy, so how can you teach the curvy women? or curvy individuals and it wasn't until someone said to me well you don't have to be gay to advocate gay rights and once they told me that it was like I just didn't care what people said thereafter and so with regards to on show I had no money whatsoever to afford the stand once I rang them up but a few weeks later I had a pick on it was like why don't you try and crowdfund it and so I I, I called a friend in America and said what well, do, do you think I could do that and she said Donna you inspire me and I think if they hadn't said you inspire me I would have just would have just been an idea that would just have gone to the wayside but because they said that I set up the page that night and at the time I was speaking to Lisa Riley about being an ambassador for Curse on Yoga and I think she gave me like 300 pounds like straight away and I got most of the money very quickly so um it was able to happen and when I went the reaction I got it, you know, was the answer I needed that there, there was a need for what I did. I, and no one knew I was even going to be there because I was. I decided to go so late that I wasn't even in the program, and I was at the furthest part of Alexander Palace at the back. So if only, if only when you went all around that you discover me, and then I got the reaction that I wanted, that what I needed, what I was doing, there was a need for that, and that was back in 2015 before you know everyone now like they're doing is saying they are body positive, and sometimes they're not. But yeah, that's how my journey started, and. Um, and it's just really helped me to heal and it's made me, it's changed my, it's transformed my life. You know, I'm doing what I love now and I'm helping people. I'm helping to helpfully evolve the image of yoga so that anyone can do yoga regardless of your, your age, your size, your gender, your ethnicity. Yoga is for everyone. Wow. That is quite a lot to, to take on board. That's, that's huge. So I'm really interested in kind of going back to the beginning with that because you kind of started, I remember teaching two of my friends in, my, in, in the front, front like room of my flat, moving the sofa back and doing that when I was doing my teacher training. And then the early experience and having a, um, something happen physically to you that you know, was, had a huge impact. Mm. And very, I mean, there's a very big difference between um, going to LA and having that whole experience with somebody who has been completely discredited as an individual mm -hmm. in your and then moving over to such an amazingly positive mm -hmm. experience of sharing yoga with people who might who would have looked at Madonna with her leg behind her head and going you know what that rather than you going wow let's try that going I am not going to go near that with a barge pole because there's no way I could have, you know, Madonna was not my inspiration for practicing yoga. So I'd love to maybe walk a little bit more slowly through that journey of what would, I'd love to know what it was like to go to America and I've only really See, I've seen people talk about the positives of hot yoga, but I've also seen the horrific abusive side of what that experience can be from having read I'm, I'm big on looking at into the abuse of women in yoga and a mm. big issue around that is the whole hot yoga movement and what that man has done in connecting mm. to that so mm. I'd be interested in all of that and how you know on your what your experience was of going to America whether you met him and how you moved from something, you know, from a practice that inspired you in one way to teaching in such a different 
way because if your curve from yoga is, is, I don't know whether it's a million miles away from what you were doing when you were teaching in America. I suppose it's, um, well, first and foremost, sorry, if you have to break down what you want to ask me. So my, my, yeah, no, but my journey didn't start originally with the Bikram. It started with, um, I, I, I was learning Hatha yoga. So when I did my initial train, teacher training was with Tri Yoga. So my background wasn't, um, wasn't through hot yoga initially. So I did one, completed that. So I got a good foundation, got the, you know, learn about the, the philosophy, the ethics of, of yoga in that respect. And then when I was going to Bikram yoga, the treaty training, I, I heard bits about him. And, um, but I thought if I'm going to spend all that money, I need to find out for myself. But I was told that you might see things, not dodgy things, but you know, the way his, his, his mindset is, you may not believe in what he's saying, but just, just take what you need from the teacher training and, and just get in and just, you know, just do it and, 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 and come away. So I knew that. And I did actually get to meet him in London because he came over. Um, and so I got to see what he's like. So I got a sample of him because he did a talk. I think it was a two or three hour talk back, um, back in 2011, I think it was. So I kind of then knew I did a bit of research by seeing him there and just said, okay, fine, I can take that and leave that. Um, and the training, like with any training, there were wonderful people there. There were some, you know, there's, you know, get a wide spectrum of people there. And um, I went there the night, you know, I had one of the best times ever. It showed me how strong I was. I was being big from yoga, you know, twice a day, every day, I said at night, and I was very strong, got stronger. And, um, and the experience gave me that sabbatical I did for my, my corporate life. If I was still doing corporate, I don't think I'd taken that time off, but I kind of got that organically. And I just literally went with the flow. I just really was open to what would happen or not, as the case may be. I personally didn't see anything. So my experience was I was there was teaching, met a wonderful bunch of people that are still friends now. And I think the reason why, and whatever they say about Bikram itself, the, the practice works. It's healed so many people. And those are the stories I heard about when I went there. Bikram itself is what got me from where I was in a job I didn't like off from that into my, because it worked, it healed me from the inside out. You know, we become yoga in the heat and sometimes you feel as though you've died in that heat and it's almost like a rebirth, but you know what you're gonna get in there. 26 postures and two breathing exercises, you know that. So if you've got an issue with your knee, you're doing it every day, you're getting stronger. And you just see the healing that people got, teachers, the stories they, they shared um, on, on that journey, it being the yoga bubble for those nine weeks, you know, people that had addictions that, you know, the yoga had helped cure them, people that were transitioning from jobs. It was just, it's just, it was just really, really good. And if you went there and took the best out of it, that's what I did. Um, that's what I always remember. And I'll still do big cream. I'm still doing big cream yoga now because, it, and I didn't realize how much it, um, it's so fundamental to me. When I did a, I did a course recently and a lot of my references came from the big cream yoga, actually. I didn't realize how much. So how much, because I've been doing Bikram now over 10 years, I think. So a lot of that experience came from that. And the people- Are you still comfortable using that, using his name? Sorry? Are you still comfortable using his name? Yes. You are. Because, you know, I, it, I suppose I, it's, it's, it's an unconscious thing. I say Bikram, you know, there's people that don't like it, but, you know, the yoga, I don't see the yoga has been him. He brought it to us, but the, the, the yoga is bigger than him. Yeah. You know, and then if you, you speak to some people said that he didn't create the series, but I, I suppose it's so entrenched when I use the name. So it's not in a way to say I'm proud of the, his name. It's just, I suppose it's just what I, I, what I know. And a, lot, a lot of studio owners have changed the name and tried to disassociate from him in, in that respect. But no matter what you, you, you say, the yoga, the yoga itself works. The yoga has killed a lot of people and a lot of people will, will stand by that. There are some who will stand by him, but everyone's got their own individual preference, whatever reason why they, they want to do so. But for me, I just go, and I don't teach the hot yoga so much now, um, but what that the, the yoga gave me was the experience to go to America and to meet some wonderful people. And even though some people think that the yoga is, but I, um, I think going to America and teaching Bikram, I met very diverse individuals, very diverse bodies. And I think that's where I started to get the body positivity. I think it came from there because there were people that had PTSD and they came from you know, Bikram yoga helped them. People with disabilities, you know, the 26 postures, very simple, anyone can do it. And he says, whether you're eight or 80, you can do it. And it's so true. Mm. So you had a very positive experience. You met people with, with, so I guess 
the, the truth is that you could have gone and been sexually abused or you could have gone and had the experience that you had. And I know that there are many people who had very positive experiences as well. And your experience was that you met people of a wide range of backgrounds who had of an extremely positive experience. And then you came out of it and you shared yoga from the place of your own personal healing yeah. and from a place of having met people from a wide variety of backgrounds practicing. Yeah, I think there were 430 of us there and I think from 20 plus countries there as well. So there might be people that didn't have the, the experience that I have. I, I can't speak for everyone. I can only speak for myself and the experience that I had on there is a positive experience. And I'm still, as I say, teaching hot yoga or whatever name, but it's still going back to those 26 postures and those two breathing exercises essentially. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, it, and, it, and, it, and it's what got me from, and that's, it got me from corporate. It's the only one that, and when you're in a Bikram class and if you get the energy right and everyone moves as one, it's such an amazing experience. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's challenging. There's, there's a lot of challenging stuff in the yoga world at the moment where there's very positive experiences that you can have out of a practice that was spread by somebody who did some very, very terrible things. So it's like, yeah, it's like a lot of things, Julia, and different industries, you know, you have good and bad in everything, you know? Yeah, absolutely, and, and one of the reasons why we're here today is because we're, we're talking about a practice that has got good and bad in it and finding a way to make it a more exclusive more more exclusive more inclusive that was the wrong word more inclusive practice and a more diverse culturally diverse practice and carrying on from that did you find that there was much more cultural diversity when you were practicing in America than when than like your original experience in the UK, or have you always had a cultural it's, diversity? It's quite funny because when I was in the UK, I don't think I was so busy in my corporate life, but um, and I suppose it kind of mirrored, you know, it kind of mirrored the yoga life and corporate life in terms of um, diversity. And I suppose I got used to being maybe the only person of colour in a lot of environments. And that transferred into yoga as well. So it's like if you got used to it, you kind of assimilate, you got used to it. But in America, I suppose, depending on where I went, I was, I, you know, I would be, there would be more people of colour there in that respect. But in London, I think I was just so busy, I wasn't in the mindset that I would maybe just finish my class, get on mat, run off to class, and run off to work because it was, I was on the mat 6 30 in the morning. That's how much I love the yoga. I'd be on the mat 6 30 unheard of and go to work thereafter. But um, in America, I think then when I could see the real benefits of what the yoga could do, I began to teach different people, different ages, different sizes, different genders, and began. And the teachers that I, um, I was mentored by they ensured that I knew I was teaching. So I think I've got a very good foundation there. So I believe when I was in Texas, that's where I got my good foundation from there. And so when I came back, I began to see, oh, yoga here is completely different. But in, in, in America, the teachers are respected more than they're in London. I can teach in, in, in London Bridge and I can get ignored because someone will think, oh, I'm an MD of a company. Who are you? You're a teacher. So you get that kind of dynamic, different dynamics there. So I noticed those kind of things there when I came back in, in, in that respect. And then came back to the yoga scene in London. It was like, you know, I, I couldn't reconcile a lot of things. It's like, well, this is yoga. Why are people like this? It's yoga. Yoga's meant to be this. And I realized it's not the yoga, it's the people. And that's how I began to reconcile with some of the things I didn't like that I was seeing in yoga. So as a black yoga teacher in London, mm -hmm. what was your experience and what is your experience? My experience is that basically you have to try twice as harder than some of the, your colleagues. And you may see that you may not get as much work as some of your, your counterparts. A newer teacher may come up and they get more work than you. Is that your experience? Um, is that your personal experience? That yeah, you can see that. Yeah, and you, and you, and you, can under, you may ask why is that person getting you know, that class more than you know, on the cover list? you may not be getting the, the class um the, cl the classes that you, you you believe that you should i remember once i was on a uh, it was a whatsapp cover group um co cover list and, and it, was, it should be first come first serve and it wasn't it was blatant i was the first to respond but someone else got, got the class and i just came out of that group i thought i'm not putting myself 
um, in that position. And that's why then Curse and Yoga really, I'm really grateful for the experiences I had because it's made me stronger, it's empowered me. And that's why I'm more independent now and do more independent stuff for myself. Mm. So as the yoga world in London, because you, you're in London, you didn't, yeah. so the experience of being a Londoner, you sit on, well, not that people are sitting on buses and trains as much as they, they were, is cultural diversity. It, you know, yeah. I, for me, I'm a Londoner born and bred, and that's one of my joys of being a Londoner, is that there is cultural diversity there. Do you think that the type of yoga that is taught reflects no, I, I think it's the area, you know, there's a lot of things that um, preclude people from going, the cost of yoga for one, the areas the yoga studios are in as well may stop people from going as well. And if you don't see someone that looks like you, why are you going to do yoga? A yoga, if you type in yoga on Google, what's the image that you see? So if you don't see yourself doing something, why would you even attempt to do it? And I can be, in my experience as a black yoga teacher, I can be the only person of colour in that room and I'm the teacher. Yeah. And I have students that will come all the way to a, a, a studio, not like it, and then come all the way to South London to me in a church hall with like minded people and feel comfortable. Because it's not only the yoga space, it's when they're going to front of house, who are they seeing there? When they're going to changing room. You know, if they're, on, if they're in the minority and they're not, why would you go there? Why would you put yourself in that, in that situation? So how do you see that situation changing? There's got to be more diversity. And, um, and, and the way I see it changing is for some of the workshops I'm doing, I'm heartened to see so many people come into those workshops to find out how they can make their classes more diverse and more inclusive. But they're seeing um, that, and I ask them to, you know, who are you seeing on the mat in front of you and who you, you're not seeing? So people become more aware because some can become very blinkered into their environment and not notice that. So with the Black Lives Matter and all that's going on now, I think there is a change happening. And I hope that it's gonna be a sustainable change. It's not gonna be like the Me Too movement where you know there's all this hype about it or it's a trending hashtag and then it's, it's, it disappears in a few months down the line. So the fact that there are a lot of teachers and, and the way I see it changing is that people are amplifying my voice, for, you know, they're being silent and giving me a chance to, to speak and share my experience and my voice as well. And hopefully this is not being seen as performative action, that it is genuine action, which I've seen. But there's also people that it is just a hashtag. You know, they, they, they were called to action. They did it for one day. And the next day they went back to business as usual. So you can see, and, and I can see that by looking at people's social media feed as well. It's like you're claiming to be, you know, you've got the Black Lives Matter hashtag. When I look at your feed or you're saying you're body positive, it clearly is not. Yeah, it's interesting that you're talking about me too. I'm working quite strongly for looking at the abuse of women in yoga, which is, and that's something that's actually been taken a little bit more seriously since me too. And it's building and building, but it's, it's not an easy thing to do. So bringing up something that is challenging, that involves work, you can choose not to do that. I, you know, I've never been abused in yoga so I could choose not to be interested not to not to do that you can teach a yoga class and think, well you know what I'm teaching meditation I'm teaching movement I'm doing something that's very nice it's helped me I'm helping the people who are coming here I don't need to do that it takes that extra step to do something that that matters and that isn't easy so that's one of the reasons why I'm talking to you because when you know, something huge brought Black Lives Matter to the world. It wasn't that the, uh, the huge challenges faced by the black community in the UK weren't there. Mm. There was something that was a galvanizing factor that came up. It wasn't that women haven't been abused in yoga for years, they have, but something triggers it. So the intention behind, we're running this event on the 16th of September, one till four and the intention behind it is for people to or you know for us as a yoga community not to kind of sit back and think oh i'm a white woman what can i do i live in a white suburb so what, you know, it's it's for us to think okay i need to be imaginative about this i want to make a difference what can i do and 
I'd love for you to maybe speak a little bit more to what it would feel. I, I don't know. Maybe speak a little bit more to that. To to it's, what, it's, to, the, to to what we need. We I don't know. You need to, you need to rec recognize the privilege and what that privilege is. And some of it is so ingrained that you don't even realize you've got the privilege. You know, you know, people say things like "I don't see color," and that's one of the biggest insults that you can you can tell me that you don't see color because. You know, some people don't mean anything by it, but you don't understand it. The fact that you don't have to go, you can go into a shop and someone's not going to follow you because of the colour of your skin, which is something I'll experience. So saying that is a, a complete insult. So you need to understand that. If there's lessons to be learned. And the fact that, you know, and I'm not saying for you personally, you, know, you can maybe go home and, you know, an issue comes up and you can just switch it off. Someone else that's not in that position can't. That again is privilege. It's recognizing there's different degrees of privilege and acknowledging that and learning what the privilege is. I've got a friend that, you know, people say that they, they didn't realize that because just by being virtue, by being virtue of white, there's privilege that gives them straight away. Yeah. You know, and there's different degrees of privilege, you know, through education, through housing. You know, people need to understand that. And in yoga, you know, peace and love doesn't cut it. You know, you can't, you know, if I come to an issue and you say, well, peace and love, I don't see it, that's spiritual bypassing. Yeah, you, you, that's a luxury you have. I can't, you know, my you, you're not you're not looking at or willing to understand my lived experience. You know, the fact that I can be in a class, I'm a cover teacher, and someone will come in, look at me, realize I'm a teacher, and then walk out again. Yeah, you yeah, know, because because of that, but they haven't given me a chance. I remember once it happened. I was teaching at a studio. This woman came in, saw me, and she like shocked. And I, I think it was she was too embarrassed to like walk out. She made, made up this excuse and said, oh, I've got an appointment to refer to, so this is an hour, an hour class. I said, okay, fine, you can come for the half an hour and go. She didn't make any phone call, nothing. She came in, did the class. Obviously, I proved myself to her. And I went to her and said, oh, you've got the goal. She said, oh, no, no, no. But she gave us that get out. If I was crap or whatever, she could have been gone. And to have that all the time, or a lot of the time in that respect. To, um, to see that and that's what teachers need to do and, and you know there's these things that happen and people sort of you know they dismiss them and by dismissing them it leads to bigger things you know if you hear something you know from a, a, a student or a colleague you know call it out because you use your privilege in a way that can help others that may not have the privilege you have and that's what we need to do you know yoga is about ahimsa and anyone you're there with if you see that i'm being it is violence to me anywhere it's words or any way cheating you you're in the yoga one you need to look at why what you're doing you know if if what you're doing is in, in alignment with what yoga is about that's what we need to look at and, and it's and i understand that a lot of people so i'm doing a few things at the moment and um, we're talking about anti-racism work but it's listen and learn from that and don't go to your friends that are black and say what can i do there's google there's so many things you can resource you can go out there to help you to find out what you can do and you know go to some of these workshops and, and, and go there and don't be afraid to be vulnerable because that question you may not ask someone else wants to know it as well so it's just open yourself to these and that's how you can learn and if you don't have anyone in your community you know look at who you're following in your social media feeds you know, follow people that you can learn from and you can bring that into your class. If someone vents into your class, you don't then risk the chance of, of, of offending them in any way, even inadvertently. At least you're doing the work to help, you know, make yoga more inclusive, more diverse for everybody because that's what it was meant for. I think that you've made a really good point there because you can worry, you can do nothing because you're worried about saying or doing the wrong thing. And also, this is a paid for workshop. It's gonna cost 45 pounds to come along to it, but everyone is welcome to come along. And if, you, if you're facing financial hardship and you wanna come along to this workshop, then we will find a way to make sure that you can come along. But when we need to do something to learn and it will benefit others, maybe more than it will benefit us to do it, it is still worth spending the money and it's even more worth spending the money to do that. We need to learn absolutely that nonviolence doesn't mean not hurting someone. It means calling out the hurt that others are experiencing. And also I like working with the chakras and the throat chakra feels like it's connected to 
having a voice and listening to a voice. So I'd like to learn more. I know I've got an awful lot more to learn about listening and learning and using my voice in a way that helps diversity in yoga. And I hope the people that are watching us now feel that too. Because if we all came to your workshop and learned from you, we would come out as better yoginis and better yogis. And, you, and, and you'll be able to understand other people's lived experience as well. And maybe you, there may be, you, may, you may find it challenging, but at least you may be aware of things that you did because there's, there's implicit bias, unconscious bias that you may not be aware of. And that's what it will bring up. No one's going to be there to an attack. It's going to be a safe space where we can, I learn, I go to some of these workshops myself, but, I, you know, and it's so good having a diverse audience because it, you know, just like how you're talking to me now, you're talking about your experience that I may not have thought of. So I can understand where you're coming from. So that's it. And it's good to be vulnerable together. That's how we'll change. And that's how we can change this world. You know, be the change you want to see in this world and learn this one. to do. I'm learning so much myself and I'm being called upon to learn other. If you look at my platform, I'm sharing so much information where people can help. And even like people are coming out and saying to me, well, I've done a base on that. When you, and there was one girl about the, you know, I don't see colour. And she said that she saw it, she saw colour years ago, but she thought she called it actually because she'd be racist, but she didn't know how to um, to talk about it. Yeah. But we just saw that the the the, the post that I shared, it gave her the, the, the way in which she could do so. And she actually, you know, remarked on it, that it gave her permission to say that, you know, what she was wasn't being racist, but she was seeing colour. She knew there was a difference there. So there's times where people saw things and didn't couldn't you know, couldn't, what's the word, um, be eloquent how they brought it out into conversation. But by learning and reading and just listening, you know, sometimes it's just a case of listening that they learn things that are unable to unlearn things as well. And it's not, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. It's a journey. You know, let's make it a movement, not a moment. Just, you know. That's beautiful. You know, a movement, exactly. A movement, not a moment. And I am certain that there are many, many yoga teachers that with a, their hands on heart supported, supported Black Lives Matter and felt in that moment they wanted to, and then they stopped because, or we stopped, or it, it didn't happen, the next step wasn't taken because the next step wasn't provided. We're here now, we're providing the next step. So if you felt, I would like to help cultural diversity in yoga, but I don't know how that relates to me teaching in my local community. And things are tough for me anyway, because I've lost my whatever we've lost through, you know, we're all facing our own challenges. It can feel really empowering while facing whatever challenges we're facing to feel that we're part of a movement for good, a movement that's gonna make a difference to other people. And I've got my fears around that, just like any other white privileged person, because it is challenging to work in a world that feels unfamiliar. So the, the easiest thing to do is to share yoga with our own little communities. That's the easiest thing to do. And then what can we do to step out of that? So. But, then, but things do get changing now because a lot of, you know, with COVID, a lot of people have to go online. Yeah. So you've got a, a more diverse, um, diverse audience out there. And if they're not coming to you online, why are they not coming to you online? So it's not, you know, you can't use, you know, the, your locations as a, as, a, as a way to say, you know, I can't attract anybody, you know, we, you know, I think now's the time we can rip the script up now and be, you know, we're more empowered as teachers and we can, we can, we can offer yoga to everyone now in, in whatever, on, on an online platform. A lot of us online, other students have opened up a little bit now, but I know a lot of people, I'm going back into that, 
that physical space, they're still staying online for now. So there's an audience out there waiting that you can reach in whatever way, shape or form. So I hope have we said enough to entice you to come along on the 16th of September. I'd like to move on to talking a little bit more about curved some yoga because it feels like it possibly is it may not be a world away from that picture of madonna with her leg behind her head. and i also don't know whether it's a world away i've never stepped into a hot yoga studio i've got low blood pressure i always felt like i'd faint if i went to a, into a hot yoga studio and there's fears that i have around that whole kind of dynamic physically demanding that's what it feels like to me um, so that's prevented me from stepping stepping into a world of yoga that has felt so empowering and galvanized you to step further into yoga but I'd love to know first of all maybe why you moved over to feeling that importance of sharing yoga with women who are size 16 plus and you know how that change occurred well that change occurred because i was in america as you know there's a lot of size diversity so i was teaching with that size anyway and there seems to be a lot of misconception big company doesn't it depends on the teacher some teachers will um do the dialogue very quickly and it'll be very fast but some will do it very slow it's the same 26 postures you know, you couldn't do it dynamically all the time. The heat would be too much. That's why you have the same posture. You know what's going to come when we say sit down if you can't take it. So it's not like power yoga. That You couldn't do power yoga well, not as far as I know in the Bikram heat. It is, it's not be possible at all. So then that could be a misconception. You know, we do, you know, there's air coming into the room. It's not, we, we're not saying you can't leave the room, you know, once you're in there. That's it. It's not like that at all. So you can sit down, you know. You know, when my class, you can sit down anyway. And we just we give you as much air. But I was teaching to diverse bodies in the room, so I think that's where it started from. I had all shapes and sizes, and they were doing the postures. And um, and the reason why, yeah, that's so that first individual I saw. But when I began, it, it was through Instagram. On Instagram, a lot of yogis um, that are curvy were empowered to share their practice, and they can do things, Julie, that I can't even do. The leg behind the head, they can do that too. So, you know, you know, you can't tell a yogi by their size, and that's what a lot of people do because they see someone curvy, they think, oh, you can't do someone slim, they can do that. It's not at all. And I, I, I know yeah. that firsthand. Oh, I, I totally agree. I've, I've, I've got friends that are much curvier than me that are much more flex, you know, physically yeah. flexible, and exactly. vice versa. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, and I think because I saw yoga meant union, and it, it clearly wasn't I mean, ha happening from that article I read. And that's when I began to see that something wasn't happening. Then I was looking around the room and seeing, well, they're not here. And then it was like, okay, we want to make yoga evolve these individuals on the map because, you know, my family, you know, that we're all shapes and sizes and it didn't stop them. As, as in, you know, the black community, you know, you'll see somebody getting down and dancing, wearing bright colors, all these things that you're told not to do. They will do it because they, they trust their body. But in the West, it's like society tells us you've got to look this way, look, be this size, this shape, whatever. And it's a load of crap, basically. I just say, you know, let your body let you know what you can do. And that's what I about yoga. Yoga for me is about self-love, self-acceptance. And when you get on the mat, that's when you can see what your body can do for you. You know, it doesn't matter about your age. You could be, I, you know, I, this, I, I go in class with people that are 90 and they can, they're still doing splits, you know, and things like that. So it's about the mindset, you know, but people seem to be, oh, you get to 50, 60, I'm going to sit down and not do much. Yoga, just and, 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 and what I love about what I do, people come onto my mat and, I, and, and as teachers, we need to realise that when someone comes into our class, you know, it's taken a lot of them to come there. You know, we need to respect them. You need to meet them where they are and not just dismiss them because it's taken a lot of courage. And I have people that book to come to my classes and they have so much anxiety because of what they've seen in the media, what the room's going to, you know, all these perfect people on the front row wearing, you know, a particular brand of outfit and looking perfect. And they, and they got their legs behind their head. I keep going back to that. And they think, I can't even do that. They come to me and say, I'm not flexible, I can't balance, I can't do this, da, 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 da. and they come, and within half an hour, I've got them doing some of those things. And they say, oh, it's because of you. No, it's not. You've got someone here that will tell you how to root your foot into the floor, you know, how to 
find your core and how to trust your body and how to have fun. So I make sure my customers are fun because I give them also permission. I say, you're going to fall out, but being yoga know, is getting back in. And once you give them that permission, they'll do anything. They'll try it. And they'll find that childlike innocence and embrace the yoga. I say, don't worry how the yoga looks. It's how it makes you feel. And they forget how it looks. It doesn't matter about, you know, looking silly or looking around the room and, you know, creating competition. Then I sh and a few weeks later, and they're not looking around anymore. They know the names, they know the postures, and they're doing it. And I'll take a video. I, what I do to, to make my students, um, I fool them into doing this, is I'll do, um, uh, what's the one where you speed it up? You, um, you know, you do, yeah, I, I don't know the name. You yeah, yeah. So I'll do it with them. So just do it, humor me. And so I'm going to do it really quickly. And they watch it. They say, oh my God, because then there's no errors because it's so quick. But they essentially are doing it right without stopping. And that's when you begin, they, they know. That's the start of the journey. I just say, the hardest part is getting them out. Once you're on it and you have a nice experience, the teacher's not going to put you off in any way and not teach, not disrespect you or ignore you then they love it. And that's what I'm finding now. And, and I found that a lot of my students, they will go to a beginner's class, what they think is a beginner's class, it's not beginners at all. You know, they go to the class and it's still a class where it's too fast, it's too quick. They're still not enjoying it. But what I do, my classes sometimes, they're like workshops. We break it down. You know, I'll, every single person will get a chance to do it. And they do. So there's no one shy about having to hide. I'm going to try it. And, in, and they really build community. They build community. Some of, I, I did a 30-day challenge recently. And I thought, how does that person know that person's Instagram? So they, they form friendships away from the class. And through COVID, communities have been made online through, through Zoom. People who haven't known they've come together. And I can't wait for them to meet up in, 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 you know, at a workshop or in real life because they have built real community. I, I would have said, no, there's no way. But because of my big from teaching as well, I think, because we're taught to cue postures, do it on Zoom. So I have people that say, oh, my God, Don, it's like you're with me because I still cue you like that. So I cue you as though I'm in the room. The only thing is the computer. And that's the way I've been taught. And that's why I teach all my classes, that everybody is seen, everyone's acknowledged regards and I don't I don't and I can actually say I don't see bodies and I don't mean in the derogatory way I don't see size I don't look at you and think oh because you're that size you can't do it you know I've done enough training now that I can modify and teach to most bodies that come into my yoga mat I've done aqua yoga I've done accessible yoga teaching yoga in the bed so I can teach anybody chair yoga so I can take the posture down and break it down and I give them permission to do as little or as much they want to do, it's their yoga, it's their body. I empower them. So if people are looking at the students that they're having coming along to their classes and they're not seeing a diverse group yeah. of people in the room, yeah. then it's about maybe asking themselves why yeah. and also giving themselves the tools that they may need to teach a diverse community and also maybe even deciding i would like to teach you know I, I want to i'd like to attract people to my class who look a very different way and how am i going to do that it, it's interesting where people start from as well because my first um yoga, yoga well, first yoga teacher was in her 60s and had us lying down doing yoga nidra most of the time and then my second one was a busty short big set um, woman, woman in her 50s and she was so agile but I hadn't done very much exercise in my life before and I put my leg up into tree and it slid down again and I put my leg up into tree and I slid down again but she gave me that that feeling that I could move and I guess it's where you know, it's where some people come from if you come from a dance background and you're surrounded by people who can already do all the movements it's a very different experience than if you've chosen to come from a therapeutic place and maybe it's a generational thing as well because I still haven't really massively got a handle on Instagram so I never see these skinny bodies <laughs> that everybody sees on Instagram it's not my world but it would be a great shame for the younger generation coming through who have been almost I don't know, brainwashed a little bit by these images of skinny people 
twisting themselves into spaces to think, to look at them like maybe if that was me, how, you know, if I was like that 22 year old now, I wouldn't have gone near yoga because I couldn't see people of every shape, color and size practicing it. Um, so that's something that you're offering, that you're set, that you're giving people an opportunity to see and experience everyone of different sizes. Exactly. Yeah. And I guess it takes time and, too. and training. So that's a reason because a lot, you know, a lot of teachers, you know, it, to be honest, when they're in their teacher training, they're not having dive or, you know, been able to practice with diverse bodies as well. But it just takes, you know, I had that experience myself. So only when I went on and traveled around, that I got that exposure, that experience. But then I've then um, made sure I've done training that I can offer that because I've been, I remember it was at the OM show teaching a workshop and there was some, uh, a lady, she came to my, she was doing floor bow and her legs were just in the, in the air and her hands were just behind her. And I thought, what the hell is she doing? And she couldn't grab her feet and no, um, grab her foot or feet. And she said that, um, no one actually ever said anything to her. She just did the best she could do. And no one actually said to her, well, grab one foot and then the other or use a belt. And she actually said to me, I did not, I've done a hundred plus classes. And I went to the teacher and I said to the teacher, is it my body? And the teacher said, yes. And I was just so mortified for her that she's the teacher put her inability to help her on, the, on that person. And I'm so glad that she was so strong and wasn't put off because some people will not go on that mat again if they get that experience. So we have the, we as teachers have the, the words are so powerful. We can devastate somebody just like that. Yeah. Or we can empower somebody. And we should be empowering people, not devastating them. If you're making people be devastated, you know, maybe what you're doing is not right for you. And maybe you don't understand that, but you have to be very careful what you say. Because people, you know, it may not be meant as a disrespect or whatever that somebody else may take it as that as a slight or what have you and you know and the things you're doing this one in the class are you always just using the strongest te um student to demonstrate the pose that can be devastating why not use somebody else that's not strong what pose is what aspect of a pose you demonstrate are you are you doing the full post you know the, i hate the word full expression but are you doing like full full dancer as opposed to showing you know bow and are you using props are you making props seem like a luxurious tool as opposed to, oh, if, if you need to. So it's like you, you're dumbing it down. So you're a beginner if you use props. So you need to look at how you're selling what people do to make the posture accessible. Yoga is accessible. It's the teachers that, that don't always make it accessible. Yeah, yeah. So for teachers who feel drawn to, I think, you know, it's something that really feels like what we all need to be able to do, but from day one, you're not always going to be able to do everything. Yeah. So it's about having the intention of inclusivity and body positive yoga. And if you have that intention and either you don't know how to bring those people into your studio, because that's something as well, or you feel like you could bring in those people into your studio, but they're leaving, so they've maybe you've, you've had people of different sizes come in, but they haven't come back and you haven't known why. Mm -hmm. Or you really feel drawn to, maybe you've had a life experience that means that you feel drawn mm -hmm. to teaching a diverse community or specifically a plus size community. You can feel actually what I really want to do is have a room full of size 16 plus people and if a few size 14 and 12 want to come because they'll feel more comfortable then they can come too that's something that you would love because it will make you feel amazing to help other people feel amazing who weren't yoga fit to start with or whatever weren't, weren't you know naturally going to step in you know, didn't need to be brave so there are plenty of people who've stepped into a yoga studio and they don't they haven't needed to be brave to step into that space if you want to make yoga a space that's easier for those people who feel scared stepping into the studio to come to, then you've got a lot to learn from Donna, wouldn't you say? Wouldn't you say, Donna? Yeah, we've made yoga a scary place, unfortunately, with the imagery and stuff like that. It's become a very scary place. And we need to show that it, it's not scary at all. It's, it's, it's the reverse of that. And, and we can do that quite easily. And that's what I've learned along the way that, you know, it's the imagery, you know, and like, 
are you putting yourself out there? Because I know a lot of teachers aren't using their own imagery because they think, oh, I, I can't, I've got a bit of a stomach. It's like, guys, you know, all bodies are perfect to me. You know, you know your body is the way it should be for a reason and just embrace it. And that's what I teach. I teach, you know, I try to cultivate and weave self-love and self-acceptance in there so they can meet themselves where they are because they get beat. All of us get, a lot of us get beaten up in everyday life and, and our yoga match is this ceasefire zone where they come, where we don't, we don't, put our projection on this like you know you should be this so you should look that way we just leave them be in that you know and there's a lot of talk about you know food clean eating and then that's coming into yoga a lot more and that's not something we're, we're not nutritionists no we shouldn't be you know guiding people i remember being in a group and someone said oh i've got a student that's that's a bit overweight oh i should have a diet and i thought when did you become a nutritionist that's the first thing we don't know the history of why you know i don't make i don't mention weight loss in my class at all and i don't and i don't compliment someone that's been slim i don't know why they think you yeah be honest. we assume and also it does work the opposite way so someone can step into the studio who's very slim and if you've got a mindset that says oh they're the slim person they can look after themselves or yeah. they're brilliant they'll be really good at blah blah that also can be just as damaging for that person who's come in who's exhausted who you know or whatever reason they've come into the space it's about not second guessing them. They, may, they, they yeah. may have an eating disorder and want refuge and we're like, oh, you know, judging them. That's not our job. Our job is just to meet them there, to give them what they want in whatever the way they want. So they can go away, they can have rest, respite from whatever's going on in their everyday life. That's what our job is to do. Yeah. So if you are a yoga teacher and you are looking for ways to be more inclusive in your teaching, and especially if you've got a penchant for that, you love the idea of curves from yoga, and that feels like something that would ring your bells, then I would really encourage you to come along on the 30th of October, and that's 1 till 4 p.m. And I, I am really excited that I have met and, and begun to get to know you, Donna, and I look forward to spending time with you, learning from you. These are the first two workshops that we're kind of working together to, to do under the kind of umbrella of Yoga Teachers Forum. I very much hope there are very many more to come. And I know that I've got a lot that I can learn from you. And I know that there are many, many teachers in the yoga community. And if you're a man and you want to learn how to teach curves from yoga to women if you're you know it, it, it's or to, men, or to men as well and men yeah. as well yeah and curves from exactly you want to get more more men into the yoga whatever you're whoever you are whatever and you could be like don't think because you're a size 10 woman who can do every yoga posture in the book and stand on your head that this isn't for you because you'll intimidate someone it would be brilliant if your room was as diverse as everyone else's. So this is for all of us. It, if, it, if it feels wonderful to make a difference as far as black lives that matter, then come on the 16th. If it feels like it, it will empower you and make you feel awesome to make the yoga world a more diverse place, then come on the 30th and if for any reason the 45 pounds to attend these workshops is not a possibility for you because you are facing financial hardship due to the times that we're currently in or for any reason that is not a reason to not come along come along if you feel drawn to and let us know because the whole point of this is to ensure that yoga is as inclusive as it can be. Have you got any final words for us, Donna? No, and I, and, and I think some of you may actually be doing some of the, the, you know, some of the, you're making your classes more accessible, but if you need guidance or you need to, you know, you need to the language, you learn all those things that, you know, will make your class a body positive class so that you don't feel as though you're going to make any mistakes. You have the confidence to go away and offer these classes to your students and to your community. Thank you so much, Donna. And I'm looking forward to meeting you. Um, it'll still be via Zoom, but um, in the context of, of learning more from you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure.